IDEO taught me one thing above all else. It taught me to listen. It taught me to shut up and listen. And so you went, I, I learned to go in, to not have the answer, to ask the question, to listen to other people, to listen to the plethora of perspectives that were out there, to not assume that my seniority gave me anything. In fact, I would describe myself then and, and now, you have to be in endless student mode, endlessly listening, endlessly learning. I'm Carolyn Hadlock, the founder of the Beautiful Thinkers Project. On the podcast, I talk with founders, CEOs, creatives, scholars, and artists about beautiful thinking. Season seven is focused on Scandinavia because they get so many things right from a social, economic, political, and of course, design perspective. In today's conversation with Paul Bennett, you'll hear him talk about the importance of listening, traveling, being the patient, and how these things informed his work to design human interaction. Today, I'm talking with Paul Bennett. He is the former uh, Chief Creative Officer of IDEO, which everyone has heard of. I've been a student of IDEO and Paul's work for several years, and I am so grateful to talk to him today. And he is in his home in Copenhagen. No, actually, I'm in my home in Boone, which is about two hours south of Copenhagen. So we live in rural Denmark. We left Copenhagen a few months oh, ago. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so I am talking with him in his home in Denmark. And mm -hmm. welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Well, just for um, our guests or our, just for our listeners, Paul and I have known each other for a while. We first met at a, in a client meeting. I remember it as if it was yesterday. Years and years ago. Mm. And since I saw him in action, I have been following his career. I just, so much about what you've done and <clears throat> what you continue to do is so inspiring. So I'm really excited to jump back in with you. Um, you know, what started in a conference room in Indianapolis, in Indianapolis. Uh, went to, yeah. I remember it well, yeah. Then went to a, uh, you were one of my early guests back in my Tumblr days mm -hmm. when you uh, answered a, a question very eloquently. I'll definitely put that in the show notes. And then fast forward to several years later and here we are today on the podcast. Um, I guess maybe the, you know, as I think about your your life and, and from a distance, I mean, obviously I've been uh, following your journey um, for for a long, long time. But I is um, I think for me the the sort of the the thread of this inter interview is really kind of a reflection back and a look forward through the lens of beautiful thinking. Okay. Let's talk about IDEO. Uh, you just the starting point. You started there um, in was it two thousand one? Mm -hmm. Two thousand and one. All those years ago. Yes. You you were there for twenty plus years. You spent the bulk of your career there, and mm -hmm. so I'd love to hear how you started. Um, mm -hmm. They had been around for a little bit, so maybe let's just start there. How did you How did you come to start working there? I'd never heard of IDEO. I actually uh, was interviewing for another job and there was a magazine in the hotel when I was interviewing and it had an article about this place called IDEO in it. And this guy called Tim Brown, who was the CEO, and it said, I remember it's so weird, it said he looked like Russell Crowe. And I thought, <laughs> okay. So I did the weird thing and I wrote him a letter and I said, hi, Russell Crowe, I don't know you, but I think um, I might be able to add something to this mix. He was talking about wanting to grow IDEO towards a more strategic place and the vision he had for it, et cetera, et cetera. And he wrote back. And so I showed up in Palo Alto with an A1 for those British, uh, those are the British, but literally like a monstrous portfolio, physical portfolio. This was those days filled with mood boards and all kinds of stuff. I'd had my own business in New York. So I had a lot of stuff. And Tim met me in the lobby and we had a kind of an hour, 45 minutes to an hour scheduled. And three and a half hours later, when he'd canceled lunch and the next appointment and the appointment after that, we just kept going. And I met this person who became kind of my other half to my creative 
brain. Um, and that began, he said, you have to come work here and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know, California, whatever, what am I doing? Anyway, so I went, we went and um, I started as, I was literally, I think the first ever communication designer that idea would ever hired. I was, I'm a graphic designer. So I was, I was patient zero of the communication design discipline, which is now one of their biggest disciplines. So I came in and everyone was like, why do we need a communication designer? Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you here? And luckily I was put on a project which was about as far away intellectually and emotionally from my kind of core, but it taught me sort of the ability to listen and learn on the fly. I was I worked on a diagnostic uh, computer, early computer for car mechanics. Okay. And with a, with a team and went into the process of, you know, and again, this was all relatively new to me of deeply doing insight and deeply understanding the mind of the people that, you know, did this kind of work, you know, all the way from mechanics through to sort of sh shop owners and small car manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, long story short, we ended up doing a presentation um, we took over a garage in Palo Alto and we did this kind of, I mean, uh, from our world, this wouldn't have been weird, Carolyn, but for, at the time it was considered to be kind of a big deal. We built this big experiential kind of deliverable. We took over a garage and we had oil drums with products and I did a bunch of ads and movies and all kinds of stuff. And we when, and we put this show on and at the end, the client burst into tears and was like, holy shit, I didn't expect this. And we were like, neither did we. So the, David Kelly wrote about this in his book. So I became the crying client guy. That was my like entry point into the idea. And so that began this journey of, of 20 plus years of going into project after project and kind of, you know, idea taught me one thing above all else. It taught me to listen. It taught me to shut up and listen. And so you went, I, I learned to go in, to not have the answer, to ask the question, to listen to other people, to listen to the plethora of perspectives that were out there, to not assume that my seniority gave me anything. In fact, I would describe myself then and, and now, you have to be in, in endless student mode, endlessly listening, endlessly learning. And I was given brutal feedback at the beginning because I came in with all my old school creative director, you know, kind of jazz hand crap and was told enough already. Nobody wants to see this from you. You need to learn to listen. You need to learn to be part of a team. You need to collaborate. You don't need to be the smartest person in the room. And so over 22 years, I, I watched my ego I have a, um, one of my dear colleagues, David Webster, used to describe the post-ego journey, the ego diminishing, the diminishing of one's ego. And the, the death allow. of the ego. Yeah, and, and and how difficult that is for somebody who's senior and who has, you know, skills. In my, my mind, I had all this stuff to offer. Um, but I watched that dissip dissipate and go down, and I watched my kind of curiosity rise and my ability to be kind of genuinely interested in other people's perspectives. So, you know, you, you take that over 22 years. I've applied, I've been lucky. I was lucky enough to apply that process to everything from healthcare to, you know, government and consumer goods, you know, across the, across the gamut. So IDEO taught me, I, I would say IDEO taught me design at its highest calling and taught me how to, listen deeply to other people and respect that I was not the smartest person in the room. Well, that you, you, you just answered my question of how did IDEO shape you, which is a, is a, is a wonderful thing. Is it true that IDEO coined design thinking? I, I mean, I think, I, I, no, I mean, design thinking has been around for a while. IDEO used design thinking and applied to design thinking. And I'm a, fan of design thinking because it's not as simple as 
post-it notes and theatre. Actually, there's real depth and kind of perspective behind it when it's done well. But IDEO used it and it created a shared language for us to be able to talk to our clients about things that were design related or creatively related. So I always think of design thinking as a way to unlock a conversation. And IDEO was very, very good at creating with clients and with consumers as opposed to for. Um, and that whole process, design thinking, design doing, designing, was something that IDEO did, very, I think, uh, does very well. Um, and so I was part of that, of the genesis of that at IDEO, I guess. What do you think Tim saw on you that day? I mean, first of all, I said, you don't look like Russell Crowe. So I, that was my first words out of my mouth. So I think he liked my kind of, I think he probably liked my honesty. Um, when I left, he wrote a really lovely note. And he said, when you walked in my office, I knew that there was a change in me and in the company. I could feel change was in the air and you sort of catalyzed that. So I think I, I provided the sort of energetic yin to his yang, Tim's very thoughtful, very systematic. I'm not. I tend to be sort of more chaotic in my thinking. He's mind map. I'm story. So we, and we've talked about, you know, he's engineering, I'm ABBA. So we're always, we always talked about the kind of weird mashup that somehow made sense. And we were always, and when we were co-CEOs together, brutally honest with each other. And you have to be that. You can't operate as a leader or as a leader with other leaders if you don't have the ability to both accept and give critique. And Tim and I, from day one, were very, very honest with each other about the situations that we found ourselves in and the journey that idea was going on and the struggles and the joys that went alongside that. So he, we completed each other in the least Jerry Maguire kind of way, but um, <laughs> we definitely had a. It was it's one of the most, if not the most, um, important creative relationships I've ever had. Well, it's the magic just permeates. It shows to to the people on the outside as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you guys have scaled IDEO so much, and I'm mm. curious to hear how how you did that because in the beginning was it was it just in palo alto or did they also no it was, where was it in the beginning when you first found them yeah when i started there was an office in london there was a small office in munich um there was an office in san francisco and one in palo alto there was an office in chicago and there was an office at the time in um, lexington in just outside of boston um so it was kind of global ish I would love to say we had some kind of, you know, huge strategic vision. We didn't. We scaled it because of demand from clients, because clients would say, oh, we we want this or we want this or we want more of this. And we would kind of build towards that. So, you know, there were certain moves, Shanghai being one of them, where we were like, we need to be in China. This is an amazing new place that we need to be kind of, we, you know, we feel like we can add value to. So there were some deliberate moves, but in general, I would say IDEO. I always described IDEO as a serendipitously growing organization. We grew serendipitously. So I think we were pulled into our future in the best possible way. And that's both geographically and intellectually. But it seems like you have, you preserved your, I, I, intimacy comes to mind when I think about IDEO. Like, how did you do that? How did you guys do that? How did you preserve the intimacy? I mean, you work really hard. Culture's a job. Culture's a really hard thing to do. And you don't just put it on the sidelines and think it's going to grow like a Petri dish. It's a thing you have to work at. I mean, as, as a global person, I worked in every single office, got to know pretty much every single person, pretty much every single project. It was my job to, and Tim was the same, it was my job to understand the temperature of the organization globally. So it wasn't a impromptu thing. It was a thing that we worked, a group of us actually worked very hard at.
And for, for me personally, I actually loved it. I mean, I, I literally was on the road for eight years without stopping. I went, I described myself as a nomadic creative and my partner, Jim and I kind of went from hotel to hotel around the world, but I was able to get to understand the nuances in local culture in nuances in what it meant to do critique in local culture. Once, which is something that I found fascinating. I yeah, was, I didn't even, of course, that makes so much sense. I have to say, I, I never found it to be anything other than an utterly joyful experience, seeing and kind of being part of a global culture informed me deeply about the world. I can now honestly say I have seen stuff in the world and experienced it firsthand, whether it be a refugee camp or a person's life or the joy or, or you know what it's like look, like to look at complex nuanced topics from multiple global vantage points i have been lucky enough to do that 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 part of the role and a, a group of us played that of spending time going from place to place was absolutely worthwhile because it cemented idea Globally, it helped us join and fuse, and there were those of us. My my dear mentor who passed away, Bill Mogridge, who I absolutely loved, used to say, we need hummingbirds to go from place to place to plus the nectar. I mean, the hummingbird it makes so much sense, but you, just of you hearing you talk about the different cultures and the different, you know, feedback and critique and having, there. do you have any, I mean, was there any not hack or short circuiting, but how did you sort of just drop into the culture and just understand it before really kind of entering it? Listen, then speak, period. I do not go in, I never, I, just, I don't do it now. I don't walk into things and be like, let me tell you about myself. I, I always ask, what are you up to? When you're next seeing the client, how can I help? Can everybody introduce themselves? Tell me what you do. Give me a sense of what you're looking from me, what looking for from me. To me, that's like cost of entry is you have to enter a room. And again, a word that a colleague of mine taught me that I have really absorbed. You have to enter a room with nuance. You have to understand the nuance. You have to read the room, understand the nuance of what's required from you in the room and not assume one size fits all which allows you to walk into a room in Munich or a room in Shanghai or a room in Singapore or a room in London and understand the differences between those things. But it's never about you walking into a room and, dis and claiming the room as yours. You have to enter the room and be part of the room which you have been invited into. So that's one hack is to just listen before you speak. And I'm sure that just permeates as you walk in. Because, I, I mean, I would imagine you don't have a ton of time in some of these places. And so to be able to walk into the room and be invited and to listen, and I, I imagine that all happens pretty quickly. Actually, a, a colleague of mine once said to me, you land deeply. And I never really knew what that meant. But, it, but, but it's a, a theme of my creative career is... I think that shallow end of the pond is as important as the deep end, by which I mean, once I was, I was once, again, I'm going to attribute all of these things. I was once told by one of my colleagues in the London office when I first arrived and I was, I'd take, come to take over the office and I was all dying to do some big thing with charts and God knows what, and be all clever in front of everybody. And he said, um, his name was Matt Hunter, and he said, people just need five minutes in the kitchen with you. That's enough. That's enough. And so I always thought you can land quite deeply with converse, a very shallow conversation. Give me a give me a Beyonce single to talk about, and I'm happy as a clap, right? So I can I can go in and talk about culture. I can go in and talk about the weekend. I can go in and talk about a project. I can go in and talk about politics, you name it. But it doesn't have to always be a big, heavy, one-sided thing. So for me, I've learned to um, enter well and play at the shallow end of the pond pretty quickly. So I can join into 
I often and did and continue to join into cultural flow of an of a location very fast um, to get up to speed with what's going on there. I think informality in a particularly in a creative environment is extremely important. The other tool, honestly, and again, I never thought I'd find myself saying this, but social media has been very, very good for me. It has allowed a window into what I find interesting, and it has allowed me a window into what I see others find interesting. So I've always used social media and continue to use my social media as a sort of calling card or as a way of, I mean, there are many, many people, both at IDEO and outside of IDEO, including yourself, that I've constantly kept in orbit with through social media because I ultimately use it as a tool of sort of inspiration. So you put all that together, actually, I I think I can land quite well in a location for a short period of time and land quite deeply. Ah, oh, I love that so much. What was it about your upbringing that sort of positioned you to sort of access people from multiple dimensions? I was actually born in the UK, but we moved to Singapore um, when I was when I was when I was a baby. My father was in the military, so I was bred to travel. My parents had wanderlust. My mother ran away from home when she was sixteen to marry my dad in Pakistan, which is about as romantic a thing as it's possible to do. So she fled rural Scotland to marry my then. My grandmother had a meltdown, but she m- married my father in Pakistan, flew to Pakistan on the other side of the world on her own, which I love. So I sort of inherited wanderlust um, from a very early age and inherited a sense that everybody was interesting from a very early age. I remember one of my one of my earliest memories, which came back to me years and years later on a project. One of my earliest memories is we lived in a lived in what were called married quarters. So they were you know, military. We lived on a corner of a military base. And I remember one day this, what I thought was a parade going on outside. I was like three or four years old, a parade going on outside and all these people with symbols and firecrackers and all kinds of stuff. And I was like, I remember going out and asking what it was. And it was a funeral. And I remember, I remember that for years when I remember moving back to the UK and, and death was a sort of Victorian era construct in the UK. It was like conceal the piano legs and shut the curtains kind of moment. And I remember growing up with things like death being celebrated. That was one of the earliest memories that I have was of the difference that I had been seeing. I'd seen something over here and then suddenly in another part of the world, it was treated so differently. So that opened up to me an aperture into this idea that there were other formats for pretty much everything, actually, as it transpired. There were other formats for education. There were other formats for how you lived your life. There were other formats for what success meant. There were other formats for what how a family unit was constructed. I'm very, very lucky in that I was brought up by highly functional parents who only wanted the best for me who encouraged me to be creative, even though they didn't know anything about it. And I always say that's, I was sort of the Billy Elliot kid, like that weird, I lived in the same town, that weird Nelly little boy dancing around, that was kind of me. And my parents never knew what to do with me, but did everything to encourage me from an early age to be myself. So I was never brought up with prejudice. I was never brought up with a sense of kind of anything that was unusual about other places in the world. In fact, they were all considered to be very exciting. And so when I started traveling, when I was in my 20s, my parents were my biggest champions and said, go and see the world. We did. It's amazing. Yeah. And I love how how your mom was so instrumental. One of the things, one of, I would say, the the themes in, in this mm-hmm. project for me has always been, we always talk about how our fathers, you know, informed us and instructed mm-hmm. us. But I've always been really drawn to the mom, you know, kind of, it seems like she permeates people at like a, at a deeper soul level, you know? So it was an amazing thing to watch as a child growing up, to watch parents that loved each other and to be given that gift of a functional childhood. I now know so many people who have not had a functional childhood that to have been given one is a real gift. And I understand how lucky I was. Yeah, the foundation. Wow. Mm. And that, you know, so then you you were born in Singapore, you went to the UK, then you went to New York from there where you kind of started your career 
or was yeah, there? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a little sojourn in Singapore again. I worked in advertising in Singapore when I was just out of college, which was kind of a fun thing to do. Um, and then did the Madonna showed up in New York with a bus ticket and a portfolio thing um, and started schlepping around on my first job in New York was with John Jay at Bloomingdale's, which was about the best training ground that anybody could possibly get. I didn't it. know you worked with John Jay. John Jay is the shit. Let's wow. Just... Yeah, he's like so he's a my... ghost. He's like a ghost and yeah. a god and a sort of and a mythical presence. But he was one of those, he, I learned a lot from him. He was one of those people who was just so go further, go higher, go be better. Never one of those creative directors. I, I would say there are two kinds of creative directors, those ones and those ones. He was one of the, he pushed you from beneath rather than controlled you from above. Um it was an a, it was a wonderful experience to be to be in his tutelage because all he wanted was work to be amazing. And so that taught me that somebody like that I could be somebody like that, that I could be this, and that that could be a that could be a valid way of, of actually being. Wow, the uh, your contemporaries, your mentors, colleagues, partners is you have quite a. Uh... A, 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 a round table of amazing influences and voices in your midst. Mm, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely cannot believe how lucky I got with some of these people. I mean, Bill Morgridge, Tim Brown, John Jay, these have all been incredibly kind. That's the core of all of them, kind people. I have had a real itch against ego for a really long time. And to have been lucky enough to have had one low ego person after another um, be my boss has been amazing. I've always found that. I've always found that the really talented people are the most confident, yeah. which makes them the most generous, do you know? Yeah, and I agree. I don't, I, I, I could not agree more. I think people who are less talented spend a lot of time telling you how talented they are or doing or enacting out their talentlessness and people who just own it and are calm about it are the people who really are the, the who are legit. It's funny. I always think about. Um, I don't even. I don't remember where I read it or where I learned it. But I love the idea of of posture and what you know. What sort of posture are you are you bringing into a conversation or to the room and or are you living your life? And um, I know that it's you know research tells us that the people who talk more and the people who are critical of ideas are the ones who tend to get the credibility in the room. And, and But it's it's so interesting to, to think about and to, to hear you live in the same space. Very early on, um, I was given a piece of feedback, which I've always, always, since the day I was given it, I've always lived it, which is, I love what you say, but not on a Friday. And I remember hearing that thinking, what does that even mean? And they were like, I don't want you to come in at the end and shit on everything. And then I have to work all weekend and like do all that crap. Wow. I love that. I love that. One of the, the themes I think in your life and something that I talk a lot about is, um, is the value of travel, whether you're, you're traveling in your mind through books or whether you're traveling through countries on a train. What, um, but I think there's a lot of fear around that. And so what, what advice would you give people who are, you know, who are, who want to, they have the desire, but maybe something's holding them back as far as immersion or the reason to do it or the, the words of confidence that you might give them to take flight? People are awesome, period. And everywhere you go, I've never been anywhere in the world where people have just been horrible. Never. People are awesome, period. And they don't want anything from you in most cases. They don't need anything. They just want to be there with you. I remember, I, I'll tell you a story. I, I went to Bangladesh. Uh, in 2008, and I was very, I was quite worried because we were. I was going on a trip. It's the first time I was going on a trip where I was told in advance you're going to see shocking things. I went. I was. I was going to talk at Grameen with Mohammed Yunus. You're going to see shocking stuff, and you're going to see poverty at, at its most raw. 
And we were asked, how do you react to complex emotions? What's your kind of way of doing this? And I said, I'm a crier. That's how it's, that's how, I, that's me, I cry. And they were like, that's the worst type. The last thing anybody needs is your tears of pity. So put yourself at the back of the bus and calm yourself down. All right. So I was in the, I was, we, I went around Bangladesh in what became known as the crying bus, right? What was the, the biggest revelation of that entire thing to me was that I didn't need to cry once because there was nothing but joy, nothing but optimism, nothing but beauty, nothing but equality there. Even you know, I went to a struggler center, which is one of the kind of places which is the you know people were real who are in really dire straits, and all people wanted to do was have a photograph taken with me, or for me to talk to them, or to sit with them. There was no begging, no weirdness, no pulling of garments, nothing. It was just we were all together. And I remember coming back from Bangladesh, going, "Oh my God, what was I? What on earth were you doing? What were you thinking? You should have known better." So, you know, I've been to Congo, I've been to refugee country, I've been refugee camps all over the world. I've been to places that are, I've sat in hospitals next to people who are dying. I've been in people's homes with complex social, emotional, mental health problems. And yet I will still say people are awesome. People want, to, they want to be with you. They want to share time with you. They want to tell you their story. They want to hear your story. They want you to hold space for them. And travel gives you the experiences that they are that are not just it's not just about seeing different things. It's about feeling the same thing in different places. So I don't think it's about going to places to see different things. I think it's about going to places to be reminded that we're all the same. And that has been my most overwhelming experience of travel. And anybody that's frightened of the world, don't be. The world is not scary. The world is actually genuinely awesome and people are genuinely great. And everywhere that I've been where I've been like, holy shit, what am I doing here? I've always had an experience which has grounded me with another human being who's made eye contact with me and said, do you need X? Do you need Y? I spend my entire life talking to taxi drivers in different countries because I just find them so fascinating as people and what their stories are and how they get there and what it is that they've learned and how this does that. And I'm endlessly interested in the similarities actually rather than the differences. Yeah, that I think that's just such a beautiful way to think about it of just, you know, what you're you're looking because you're right. I mean, people say, I want to go see new things, I want to go to different places, but it's not about the places, it's about the people. But this concept of finding the similarity and and uh I think it really does just take all the the fear out of the out of the room. That's that's lovely. Um, do you have a favorite city that you like to think in or walk to think? I have a favorite country, which is Iceland, which we'll talk about no doubt, and I ended up living in. Bada smallvies. Bada smallvies. Suppose a woman said something to you in Icelandic and you didn't understand what was being said. How would you say, excuse me, I don't understand? Asakith eskileki. Asakith eskileki. Asakith eskileki. But Iceland is, is two things. Iceland is awe-inspiring because of just the bonkersness of everything you can't comprehend iceland and on on any level so you know many cities i often say this many cities are like a bit of other cities joined up right where you know shanghai is a little bit like paris times you know tokyo iceland is just like the moon right so i mean it's it's literally like going off 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 the world so my so the first th thing I would say about Iceland is that it's just it, it clears the mind of any kind of construct because it is unlike anything else and the nature and the beauty of it is so awe inspiring that you cannot be you cannot be humbled by it you have to you have to live in grace with Iceland and the second thing about it is that it's deeply creative and I remember when I first got there when I first went to Iceland in two thousand and eight asking the question. So is is Bjork like super creative? And somebody go, went, 
she's not that weird here. Like, she's kind of normal. Like, we're all that weird. I, I don't know if, if you or any of your listeners have read the book, um, The Geography of Bliss by... Um, I haven't. It's it's a fabulous book. I would encourage it. Eric Wiener. And the first chapter is about Iceland, and it talks about the seismic creativity of Iceland and how because Iceland is constantly moving and jangling and the earth is constantly vibrating, its creative spirit is constantly jangling. And I've always thought that was such a lovely metaphor. So like the I'm, literal frequency is what... Literally, it's vibrating. Literally, yeah. when we always talk about creative people vibrating, yeah. the country is vibrating at a different frequency and that somehow unleashes between and the darkness and the lightness and all the crazy weather unleashes something very primal that's how i would describe Iceland. it's a primal form of creativity that comes out of there circling or like hearkening back to the story you're telling about your your father and when mm. he passed away and i think he actively asked you not to come see him is that do i have that he right did. He did. Yeah. What my father's last words to me were, um, I don't want you to see me like this. So um, I called him. I was in California. He was in the UK. And I said, you know, I'm coming on, I'm getting on a plane. I was in Los Angeles. And I said, I'm getting on a plane. And he said, don't, I don't, I don't want you to see me like this. And he died two days later. And, and then that kind of took you to Iceland, right? Was it, there a well, it took me, it took me on a, it took me on a spiral from which I, I don't think I ever recovered, which was it took me on a kind of quest to look at things like to go into the I, I described it at the time. I'm going to go into the void and I'm going to bring creativity into the void and the void, meant the darkest, deepest, weirdest topics. And at the time for me, that became end of life. Um, and Iceland and understanding, you know, different kind of cultural approaches, but also finding a place where that wasn't considered weird, where, you know, they look at all of these topics. I became quite excited about Icelandic folklore when I lived there and started talking about all the folkloric traditions there. Um, but, yeah, my, my dad unleashed something in me Um and I think he did, I actually think that was his final act of creativity, if you like, was to set me free from the burden of seeing him diminished. But to, he gave me the best creative brief that anyone's ever given me, which is make don't die like this. And that became a quest and still is a quest, um, was to look at end of life as a topic area, which I did for quite some time. Well, first of all, I commend you for uh, honoring your father's wishes. That must have been, I can't even imagine how hard to fight every impulse to yeah. do that. But that was sort of your last gift to him was to yeah. to honor his wishes. And then, mm -hmm. and then you pursued this idea of, you know, and I did not know that your earliest memory, that's really, that makes so much sense of death is this celebration. And so you started thinking about how you wanted to die and leave this world. And that's, I remember when sort of Iceland came into, into view. Uh, I, so I, I wrote a piece on Medium, which wasn't my tool of choice at the time, but I thought I'm going to put something out here. And I said, I want to die looking up at the Northern Lights. So this yeah, I Iceland. remember, I read that. Yeah. Right. And I and I asked the question, can death be designed? And did not expect what came next, which was a tsunami of responses from people going, please do something. My partner, my husband, my sister, my brother, I, suicide, cancer, mental health, you name it. I got deluged with people saying, I can't die like my dad. I can't die like my brother. I don't want to die like this. I want choice. I want a different relationship with death. I want poetry. So I went off on this quest to see what we could do and, you know, met people like B.J. Miller and ended up having all these companies, doing a lot of work in that space. We ended up doing work with the psilocybic research, looking at PTSD and understanding, you know, people who were faced with things like metastatic cancer diagnoses. And again, back to your earlier point, 
no misery in all of this. Not the what I, I was I was lucky enough to be asked to speak at the American Association of Palliative Care Physicians at a conference in Phoenix in Arizona, five thousand people. To be honest with you, I was absolutely convinced I was going to be booed off stage, right? And I was convinced, like, why? Who was I to stand up there and say, "Can death be better designed?" And I got a standing ovation because people were just absolutely desperate. For there be for there to be a different narrative that wasn't endlessly kind of depressing and you know end focused. And I said on stage, death has taught me one thing, which is to resolutely live. And that's the that's what that project, that's what that, that's what my father gave me. My father gave me that brief. My father gave me that quest. My father gave me that. Now that's become my kind of personal way of that's my that's my life now is I resolutely live. And so that all began with that with my father saying, I don't want you to see me like this. Wow. Well, let's fast forward to the significant event that brought you to Denmark. Talk about that. Well, my worst fears, my worst fear for years. And I sort of made jokes about it, which now I find horrifyingly morbid, morbid, was kind of keeling over somewhere. I used to say, oh, God, I can't die in O'Hare. Please don't let me die in O'Hare. Please don't let me die on the escalator in O'Hare Airport. Like, that, that can't <laughs> be my end, right? And August of 22, I was on a business trip. And I actually thought I had COVID. I, I couldn't. I woke up and I was wheezing. I was wheezing. And I went out for a walk and I came back and I was like, I'm not, I'm not feeling very well. I'm going to take a nap. I woke up, I don't know how long later, on the floor with my sort of arms all mangled around me. And I assume I had tried to avoid hitting, there was a big marble table next to my bed. So I had tried, to, I'd fallen on my face and there was an elephant on my chest. And I thought, oh, fuck, here we go. This is it, right? This is now, now look what you've gone and done was the first uh, what thought in my head. So I got myself to hospital. Um, and actually, I have to say, you know, love them. The National Health Service, the British National Health Service were absolutely amazing. So they put me, you know, this triage nurse took me to, to one look at me. There was a huge long queue. She just took me to the front of the queue and she's like, come with me. Put me in this room, room three, room three, very critical. And so this young medic guy came in and and this became a pattern. He said, hi, I'm Ed. Is it okay if I call you Paul? And I said, sure. And he said, Paul, what's going on with you? And I said, I don't know. I said, I think I'm having like a stroke or something. And he said, put some wires on me. And he said, um, stay here for a minute. Uh, how do you feel? And I said, I feel like I'm falling backwards. Mm. And I just I remember him looking at me and thinking, uh, and being very calm. And he said, I'll be right back. And so the next thing I remember was the phrase crash cart to room three and just everything going thermonuclear. And there were just people all around me, but, and I was sort of floating in and out of consciousness, but he, seriously, Carolyn, here's the, here's the kicker in all of this. Every single person, hi, my name's Janet, is it okay if I call you Paul? Hi, my name's Mike, is it okay if I call you Paul? My name's, is it okay if I? And I have said, I have done a million presentations, I've done a million healthcare projects, and I have said it a million times, Patient as person is the most critical thing you can do. Yeah. It gives you control. Person. Yeah. Give, it doesn't even give you control. It gives you a sense of being alive. I honestly think it's more than control. I think it's a sense of, I was alive because I was being addressed by my name. I wasn't dying because I was being talked about like I was an object, right? So eight people, oxygen, adults later, tubes, the whole nine yards. And... I just remember, all I can remember from the entire experience is, hi, I'm Ed. Is it okay if I call you Paul? And at the end of the whole thing, I'm sitting there and I'm all shaved off and weird looking and sweaty and crazy looking. And there's this Scottish, which I'm going to remember, immediately I'm thinking, oh my God, my mother's here. My mother's come to see me. Scottish um, 
cardiologist sitting next to me and he says, I'm David, is it okay if I call you Paul? I said, hi, David, yes. And he started asking me all these questions and about varying things, what got you here? And I said, um, I, asked, I answered all his questions and he said, do you mind if I make a, a reflection? And I said, I said, no. And he said, um, you were very intelligent, you seem very intelligent. And I said, thank you. And he said, um, why, what on earth are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I remember saying, if I answer that question, I'll start crying. And once I start crying, I won't be able to stop. And he said, that's the question you will have to answer when you are alone. And that led to everything changing. It led to me leaving work. It led to me leaving Iceland. It led to me coming here. It, it just pivoted. Unless it led to me losing 100 pounds. It led to an absolute transformation of every single part of our life, um, which I'm very grateful for. And but but also it it led to back to these moments. It led to a realization of what it really is that you and I do, which is we say, "Hi, I'm Paul. Is it okay if I call you Carolyn?" Because that's an act of that's one of the purest acts of creativity that I have ever seen, or one of the purest pieces of if you want to call it service design. But that's one of the purest pieces of design I've ever experienced. So now when I'm asked, as I am often asked, what's your favorite brand? And everybody expects me to say, like, you know, Chanel. I say the National Health Service because they saved me by calling me Paul. So that's what that to me is. If I had to write a book about design, I would say, my name is Ed. Is it okay if I call you Paul? Is that would be the opening words. Yeah. And what an amazing question for that doctor to ask you. What are you doing here? I mean... Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of us think with with health, these things happen, you know, to us and to sort of put you in that moment in that very visceral space of, you know, what habits, what things, what thoughts, what realities have you, have you done to put yourself in the spaces? Mm -hmm. That's a that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So somebody who was prior to that studying this sort of, you know, end of life, can mm -hmm. we design death? You have this near-death experience exactly did it change how you thought about how we could design death it didn't it it made me realize all the things i was saying all along are actually fundamentally right it is the tiniest things that make the hugest difference so it is not about whiz bang technology and a operating room of the future and decorating the room in bloody blah, blah it is tiny it is the human touch and, I, and that is one theme, if I had to sort of extrapolate over the last 25 years, one theme that has been really prescient for me is the smallest human interactions are the most profound design intentions over and over and over again. I said, to be the patient in the center of the circle you spent 25 years designing, was a humbling experience to say the least, but actually it made me realize that in many cases, the things that we had suggested over the years, patient as person, tiny gestures, you know, re reflections and giving people tools to connect were, were actually the right answers. Wow. I mean, we talk about design thinking, that's at its best when it just presents this sort of raw truth and I say to my clients all the time, you can't replicate truth. You can't mythologize it. You can't do a mood board of it. You can just show it. So to me, that was a, that was a very early indicator that truth told as opposed to myth sold is a powerful way to 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 go through you know, this this world that you both occupy. I mean, I've done a lot of work in government since you and I last spoke, and I've asked a billion civil servants, why are you here? It cannot be to push a policy paper around all day. It must be to serve people's lives better, correct? And once you reignite that in them, or say to doctors, you spend all day doing administration, but where's your oath that you took? Most people want to get back to that in some way, shape, or form. 
Um, and so if you can find a, a channel, a meridian, if you want to call it that, that touches that, then then it's gold. And so a lot of the work that I've done over the years has been, if you like, sort of touching the heart. And reconnecting people with themselves. I mean, just as I'm hearing you and listening to you, it's it's not, you know, we, we do the labels of you're the client, I'm the creative, I'm the CEO, and like n- none of that matters. And if you can help them reconnect with themselves in some small way, then they can then in turn connect with the people they're serving. Yeah, I mean, back, back to Bangladesh, everybody was the same. We were all people. And I now, you know, this is one of the benefits of getting older, it's one of the benefits of being 60 is I just have no room for the kind of bullshit that is required to be able to have to kind of navigate that. So to me, it's like, let's tell the truth. Let's be in it together. Let's all work on this in some completely holistic way. All of our ideas, all of our perspectives are valid. You're not you and we're going we're gonna to all do it together. And that has, re- an IDEO gave me that confidence to be able to do that again and again, this sort of, repeatable we process versus I and I and they. Yeah. That's been very helpful. So is is it have you ever cried in a in a presentation or a meeting as a crier? Oh God, are you kidding me? I've cried a million times. Of course. Cried all the time. I mean we did a project about aging, um, which was one that was very, very difficult because you know, we we all the the theme of the project was it's not about people over there, it's about all of us. And I was the intro. And actually, the piece of music that I was playing for you before we began, which I probably should play at some point on this podcast, but I had been in China and had witnessed, I don't know anybody would would know this, but Fuxing Park in the center of Shanghai is where Chinese, often older generation Chinese people go early in the morning to exercise and dance. And I remember making a movie of these old, uh, older Chinese people waltzing. And I remember saying at the time, they didn't waltz past me, they waltzed through me. Mm, I remember, I think I saw this. I I saw your photo of it, I think, or your movie. So, So I cried pretty much every time I present crying now. I cried every single time I presented that because that the evocation of that moment over and over and over again was very real. And also that was a real, I always say, if I can fill in on my skin, it's an insight, right? An insight is a visceral reaction to something. So I've had many, many times. When I was in Congo, I went to a I went to a church in Congo. Uh, the team took me to church in Congo, and these kids came out and started singing, and the, the harmonic was just so spectacular that I burst into tears. And my colleague John and I, he was an awesome, we were both ex ultra boys, were holding each other's hands, crying in this oh. church in rural Congo, going, "What on earth is going on?" Um, so yeah, I actually think that's part of the, I think you have to, emotional accessibility is part of our job. I would hate to not feel what it is that I do or not feel what it is that other people are feeling. So I have no fear of that stuff. Yeah. Which is, which is so, I I love that because I feel like, you know, as a woman, you, you, you get that beaten into you, like never let them see you cry, never cry in a meeting, never, you know, like that's a badge of honor and um and it's it's so refreshing to hear somebody say no it's not it's actually holding back connection it's like I, to I show up and that, be I, you i think you i think that the biggest gift you can give people is authentic emotion that is the biggest gift you can give anybody period never mind in the contract of a project or of a boardroom or a piece of work but to stand there and be authentically telling the truth, A, telling the truth, and B, feeling the truth that you're telling, that's, people People can see that. I mean, I've had feedback over the years of people saying, God, you really brought it. I'm like, I was really feeling it. I wasn't bringing it, I was feeling it, and I was just allowing it to come out. Yeah, you just showed so, up. Yeah. What do you want to do still? Like, So I would say there were sort of two or three 
bits to this. Phase one was recovering, which was all of the things that you kind of just, that I just told you. So getting over a heart attack, kind of looking in the mirror, saying, now look what you've done, now undo it. And all of the kind of mechanics of, of that, that was the first six months, let's say. The second six months, I would say, was kind of ruminating, which was, I made myself a, a to-do list of, and actually a, a not to-do list was what I made myself. I'm not going to do bullshit things anymore. I'm not going to not tell the truth. I'm not going to do bad work. I'm not going to apply myself to things that I don't think I want to work on. I'm going to f- focus on things that matter to me. And now I'm entering, and, and that required also changing countries and starting to think about, you know, putting myself on LinkedIn and all the grown-up things that I sort of rolled my eyes over for many, many years, and suddenly I was doing them all. And now I'm just getting back into it. And so I'm starting to consult again. Excuse me. I'm starting to think about what it is that I want to do and where I want to do it. I'm traveling again, which is very exciting, actually, this time now, Um, but with a very different, much less frantic uh, way of it all so you know if i i actually have to say i'm one of those people that enjoyed being 60 60 was last june um and i enjoyed that settling in of myself at that moment i always had this tremendous fear that it would all evaporate at a certain age and that i would be like some old geezer with cargo pants who was no longer able to do it and Actually, the opposite was true. I actually, one one of the things I love about Scandinavia is that age is revered and people respect older thinkers and it's people are valid contributors to society as as they age. It's one of the, actually one of the main reasons why we moved here. It's my partner is older than I am and both of us wanted to be in a society that supported older people. Um, so to be 60 and creative here is not weird at all. To be 60 and creative here is awesome. So, you know, I actually think all of those things coming together um, have put me in this place that I currently find myself, which is actually more excited about the future than I've been in many years. Okay, last thing, and I'm so curious to ask you this because I ask everybody, but you've lived your life this way, but how would you define beautiful thinking? Um, I would define beautiful thinking as allowing thoughts to come from other places other than your own head. I am a huge believer that thoughts come from the ether from all kinds of different places. You don't have to have them for them to be beautiful. You have to channel them. So to me, that is about not having the answer. It's about being curious about the question. It's about listening. It's about being open to having disparate points of view come at you. It's not being the cleverest person. It's certainly not being the loudest person. And it's allowing thoughts, whoever they come from, to touch you to move you. I am a huge believer that if something can make me cry, then it's a beautiful thought. And if I'm lucky enough to be the person who can make someone else cry, then that's even better. But I'm very happy to be moved by thoughts from somebody else. That to me is a beautiful thing. I love the idea of channeling. That's really great. And then the idea of allowing thoughts to come from someplace, somebody someplace else is is lovely. Mm -hmm. Ah. That's a perfect place to end. I could talk to you all day, but thank you, Paul, for your generosity, your transparency and sharing. It's just, it's, it's always a pleasure. Lovely to see you again. Really lovely. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Beautiful Thinkers podcast. To follow along this season, subscribe to the podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us at The Beautiful Thinkers on Instagram and LinkedIn. Music by Midwest Got It. I want you to, if you don't mind, show your tattoos when when you send me photos. But yeah, I love them. I love them. On a, a homage to my father. When I was 10 and my dad didn't know what to do. If I, I pulled this out because I, I thought you might ask me. When I was 10 and my dad didn't know what to do with me. 
he showed up one day, he came up down our garden path with a magazine called The Golden Hands Encyclopedia of Crafts. Here it is. 98 weekly, I have them still, 98 weekly parts. One of the things I became completely obsessed with was thread art, right? So years later, I found this tattoo artist who did what he called spiritual geometry tattooing, which was essentially vector-based tattooing, Japanese guy. Oh, my gosh. That took you a long time, I remember. Like, you had to travel back. I did six trips to Amsterdam. It took 200 hours. It was fucking painful. But every (laughs) time I showed him, I showed him this. I showed him sending him this, and he was like, got it, got the brief straight away. (laughs) And so my dad lives on on my arms and back. In fact, my back is a symmetrical, double symmetrical. I remember. Double helix. Uh, but that was the beginning when I was 10 years old of a journey in string and thread that ended up on my body. 